Well, you don't know. Like, but I, it, yeah, I don't think he was big on the startup scene. I have a dream. This nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. With all due respect, that's a bunch of malarkey. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Democracy simply doesn't work. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It's the Ricochet Podcast with Rob Long. I'm James Lalex. Peter Robinson is out. He'll be back next week. But this week, we've got Byron York on DC shenanigans and Rich Goldberg on the crypto crash. So let's have ourselves a podcast. I can hear you! <laughs> Live from New York City, it's the Ricochet Podcast number 593. <laughs> There's a Ricochet Podcast, be part of the most, five, I know, 593. How did we get there? Well, we got there partly by people like you, as they say on the National Public Radio. People who joined Ricochet to be part of the most simulating conversations and community on the web. Uh, you can join, and if you join quickly, fast, like right now, you can be part of the meetup that's coming in New York, where I happen to be. I'm James Lilix, sitting right now in that most coveted of location, a, uh, a hotel room with a fantastic view of an air shaft um they say that air shaft is a bad mother shut your mouth it's a great it's a it's a fantastic chic center of the world air shaft as new yorkers are like to uh like to say and rob you're also in new york i am in new york i'm uh, a little bit farther uptown from you not too far although you know there's a i i just discovered this i, I heard it that i don't know exactly where it is and i was going to the dmv someone told me oh right around the corner of the dmv facing the ocean uh, I mean the bay. I mean, you know, is the uh, is the old Cunard Line headquarters, uh -huh. and you could go and you could buy your ticket on the Titanic or something, uh, and uh, there's still the medallions of the various locations that they would go on the on the front. Which I'm I, I'm now sending you. I know that's the kind of that's lilacs bait for you. That you'll that's what you you're going to now want to go see all that. So can't wait. Go find well, it. I went to Pier. I went to Pier 15, which is notable for being sure. a. Uh, a location. Sorry, my my motel my hotel coffee is gurgling here. That's what you hear. It's not me from the diner breakfast. I'm, that, that's the other thing. I'm right across the street, literally from a diner with a neon sure. sign. It's completely wrapped in construction, like everything else. But uh, I went there for a breakfast this morning. And it was absolutely perfect. None of that chic stuff for me. No, just home fries and white toast. Anyway, so I went to Pier 15, uh, where they had uh, it was a shot from Annie Hall was taken there. Right, so I had to go stand there and pay my respects. But there's a big, right. big, big ship, and it's an old ship with the rigging and the sails and the rest of it's a big tourist attraction. Sure. And I was noticing something: four mast, three masts, I think, two. There are flags. The topmost flag was the rainbow flag. The next <laughs> yeah. most flag was New York State, and then there was some, I think, a New York City flag. The flag that was lowest in this order was the U.S. flag, which ought not to be. Now, I'm not going to argue about whether or not New Yorkers think themselves on top of you. I'm just saying that's not flag etiquette. And I wanted to walk no, up to the no. gaggle of, of people with the crew shirts and say, did you know you're violating flag protocol? But that would instantly, instantly tag me as somebody who cares about such trivial, ridiculous things. Yeah, I mean, I actual flag do. etiquette is, as a, from my Boy Scout days, I know, I mean, I'm trying to like conjure back. It was many, many years ago, as you know, but uh, the flag etiquette is pretty clear. It has to be the 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 the, the American flag, the, the federal flag, I should say, must be at the top. At the but top, you can't right. actually mix your flag staff. You're, I think you can have the, you can have government, flags on you could have the state you have the federal flag the state flag and the city flag on one flag step but you can't mix and, and them then, up it, no you you can't put the the rainbow flag on top of the uh, of, of the u.s flag you mentioned the boy scouts interesting you do so i'd been in manhattan for about 11 minutes before i was actually robbed uh, it, i'm having the really? full experience here well sort of kind of i made the mistake of using my credit Good. card at the newark oh. at the newark train station in order to get here and i think hmm. they had a skimmer inside because within about a minute or so i started getting all of these false little attacks somebody had gotten That's my technically being, being being robbed in new jersey just so you know yeah i guess so that's true but i by the time the stuff hit me i was i was in new york and one of the uh, one of the false little uh, attempts to uh, use my credit card was made at the boy scouts for one dollar, and I thought, is this is this somebody sort of atoning for what he's doing by giving a little, you know, throwing money? Oh, it's to the, the test, oh, do they have right? Isn't that what it yeah. is? Yeah, it's the dollars. test to well, see if it works. 
to see that the dollar is just like if it goes through and you don't right. complain, then it works. And then they go and they, I mean, I'm sure it isn't a, uh, and they wrong. Sure no, and if that goes through, they're going to give you. I'm going to give a thousand dollars to the scouts. Um, well, on the way on the on the way from the train station from Penn Station, I walked down here about an hour and a half hike or so, which was fun. It's a nice um, walk, actually. It, it it depends where you go. There's there's some stuff that uh, there's a you know south of 31st north of Houston. It's not that exciting. You get a little little Chinatown, little Italy. Walked through a uh, a rally, a choice rally, or an ad or a, a abortion rally, the decision um, rally they call it now. A deci- is that what they're calling it now? A yeah, they have a rally. whole new way of uh, they 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 they, uh, they they focus group some language. So it's not pro choice anymore. It's pro decision because you know some people, James, don't have a choice to saying you have a choice implies some kind of privilege true and the aclu came out today or yesterday i believe with a tweet that said the people who are most negatively affected impacted by an abortion ban uh, includes trans people and lbgtq plus people it would Hmm. seem to me that that would be a disproportionately none unlikely to but whatever we live in a world of strange equivalencies right you may have Perhaps somebody said this to you. Women are going to vote out the GOP in November because they're very angry about the Supreme Court decision. And also, women are very, very angry about the baby food shortage. Now, that's a false equivalency. But do you, do, you, do you note that that is now taking on larger amounts of... Right. Uh, of pre- Unless, of course, it's just a Fox News thing. I think there was a reporter. Well, no, I think, I think it's true. I mean, I think it's, uh, some things are... I think some things become... Uh, political um, sim- symbols or footballs, and they're stupid or they're silly, right? And some become political symbols, and they're meaningful because they represent something. Yes. Um, and um, and, and the specific case here about baby form it represents a kind of a cavalier out of touchness that the Biden administration has, and the sort of the kind of the progressive uh, movement in general has to sort of ordinary people's concerns. So the obsession with the fact that there's a formula going to the border may or may not, and actually tr- truly may, not, may, or may or may not be true. It may or may not be as being reported in sort of the outrage uh, organs that we have, but it does symbolize something that people know to be true, which is that in the m- middle of what is in fact a domestic crisis on a bunch of fronts, the Biden administration seems unable to take one action or two actions or clear action of any kind to address the issue, or at least to signal to the American people that it understands the problem. So, you know, mm-hmm. gas prices are through the roof. And so what does it do? It cancels pipelines. It cancels oil drilling leases. Now, you could argue, well, those aren't really going to come online in time, blah, 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 blah. That may be true. The psychological effect hasn't, it knocks down the price. It, it does everything. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it also su- suggests that the administration understands that you're in, that there, there's trouble and it's trying to help. Uh, mm-hmm. Their total cavalier, tin ear, um, not, not tin ear, they're d- utterly deaf ear to the concerns of the American people. Just, it, it, it just, it's staggering to me in in a in a i am not a doctor i or not i am not licensed to practice medicine in the state of new york but a a president who was fully in command of his awareness facilities meaning he was reading the newspaper which all presidents do or at least watching the news which some do too much or at least talking to his friends, which some do too much, he would understand that what he needs to do is go in the Oval Office tomorrow morning and fire a bunch of people, starting with his chief of staff, who is probably the most incompetent chief of staff we have had in the White House since I can't even remember when. Um, mm-hmm. This guy cannot do the job. This is an administration that cannot do the job. And the fact that this is not obvious to the person sitting behind the big desk suggests that the person sitting behind the big desk can't do the job either. Um that this these kinds of crazy mistakes, completely out of touch. Well, you know, what do you expect? I guess you, you we're really talking about a guy who's really out of touch. But I, it, I find that very strange been, for a politician. They said they've been on it for months, right? They've been aware of this for months. Well, if they've been on it for months and they can't fix a baby food shortage um, by changing the labeling requirements, all of a sudden, you know, airdrops, air, right. airlifting some stuff in. If they can't do it in months, it makes you wonder what else they can do. Now, as we've as we've been talking about for a couple of years here since the pandemic started, we've seen every single institution practically that we 
expected would be able to do the baseline minimum to keep things going has has proven itself to be inadequate to the task. And I'm not exactly going to say that the nation's baby food infrastructure has shown to be wanting here, but if they've known about this for months and they haven't done anything, and all of a sudden we're in the situation now where they're scrambling and you have people on TV talking, as I heard this morning, that we need a national stockpile, a national reserve of baby food, like they're going to haul a lot of mountain somewhere and store the stuff. No, getting baby food on demand on the shelf is part of the expectation of normal daily American life. Going yeah, to the store and getting solves some. that problem. Right. And, and if out, they're going, if they're out at nine o'clock at night, they're going to restock whilst you sleep. And it'll be there when you get there in the morning. That's the right. baseline right. expectation we have of stores all over the place. So that starts sundering. And it makes you wonder at some point, something is going to be, is going to be illustrative and symbolic enough to be what I call maybe the Skylab moment. Do you remember Skylab? Yeah. 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 A very Sum, important. Summer I seven, think you're right. There's a cultural touchstone. Summer of 79, it fell. And now it was designed to do so. I mean, they expected that it, after it outlived its usefulness, it would right. deorbit and tumble down. And yet, but Skylab falling was symbolic in a way because, how, you know, a few years earlier, we were going to the moon, Alice. We were flying to the moon. And now we put something in orbit and it fell. It just tumbled. And we had that sort of the right. whole feeling that we had in the 70s that our cars don't work and our leadership is bad and our money is crap and our culture. Somehow that came up, came together in sky. So, so there's going, I don't know if baby food is it, but something is going to break it's through. A sim- and be it's, sim- just- it's symbolic. I think you're right. It is symbolic. I mean, that, that, the symbolic of the way people feel and the way. And, and what was surprising to me is that when. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be nonpartisan about it. I think just in terms of mm-hmm. what, what happens with presidents when they get in there. When presidents get in there traditionally, I mean, this is like what begins with Warren Harding, or it doesn't begin, but you know, Warren Harding mm-hmm. said, hey, it's not my political enemies I'm worried about. It's my friends. It's my goddamn friends. You know, that's uh, who took him down, right? Um, well, when presidents get in there, they rarely, they, they don't sit and stew about their political enemies so much. They have the, 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 the people doing that. What they sit and stew is the incompetence of their team. When they... Well, a gasket when 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 Reagan very rarely blew a gasket, uh, it wasn't because Tip O'Neill had done something or some, some opponent had done something. That's considered normal. That's the state of play. It's because somebody mm-hmm. on his team had blown it and made mm-hmm. him look bad or look stupid or look flat footed. And you're not supposed to do that. And um, this guy, Biden, just doesn't seem to have an awareness of how rotten and incompetent his team is now, I would say probably the one area in which they are, I mean, I, they are probably following a policy that I disagree with, with regards to Ukraine, but it seems like it's a consistent policy that they're executing. So I, I'm, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's incompetent what they're doing. I just think it's probably wrong, but their domestic policy where we are a constellation of crises, right? As 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 hilariously symbolic as a baby food shortage to uh, mm-hmm. you know, political death, which is gas hike, insanity, right. inflation. They they just seem to be unaware of any of these or how to solve them or even how to look like they're trying to solve them. Instead, they seem to be doubling over, bending over backwards, trying to prove to the American people that they don't give a crap. That and not only do they not care that gas is X number of tens of dollars of a gallon, but they think it should be 50. And not only do they not care that there's no baby formula, but they're going to give some of it away to some other people. Like, it just seems so insultingly incompetent that um, I would feel more comfortable if I felt they were doing it on purpose. But I know they're not. They're just mm-hmm. really, really bad at this. Right. It's hard to shift from saying we should have gas prices like Europe to saying we shouldn't have gas prices like Europe. They wanted it before because they wanted everybody to stop destroying the earth and making polar bears drown with their cars and the rest of it. But now, all of a sudden, it's the sort of thing that they might want to get around before the elections. But they're not going to. And there's not going to be enough time. Switching gears slightly, though, because um, we could you know, talk all day about how these sure, guys right. don't seem to know, know what's going on. Um there was a piece in the Washington Post. The reporter went out and asked a whole bunch of game companies how they felt about the Supreme Court decision. <laughs> now, I read that to the reporter. Read right, that to the, line, like to the reporter's credit, he did go on Twitter and you know he did the uh, you know the usual lol y'all big mad triggered, and he explained that uh, 
with previous social movements, George Floyd, et cetera, that uh, these companies had made a statement that they had put all black you know, avatars up in their site to indicate solidarity. And since they'd done that, then he was going to ask them about this. Now, good point. Um, and so I'm not really all that concerned about the guy trying to gin up this story. What I am interested in is this is, is companies that said, maybe there's a downside to not leaping on the current thing. Maybe if we make peanut brittle, we should confine our comments to peanut brittle. But you can't do that anymore. I mean, the personal is the political, the political right. is the political, the economic is the political. So everybody has got to be out there with their flags flying, letting everybody know they're virtuous. And in this case, it actually comes back to bite some of them because they don't want to take a stance on that issue. It's also a more complicated issue. I mean, to be fair, I mean, uh, to these companies, first of all, it's bizarre to be calling up video game companies and asking them. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, do you think um, a policeman should put his knee on somebody's chest and kill them? when he's unarmed mm-hmm. um and the answer is like no i don't think that should happen right now the fact that it happens you know fewer than 10 times a year the fact that it's rare the fact that everybody went insane about it and oh and, and the country kind of convulsed itself into uh, overreaction involving riots and riots in the streets um it's a separate issue the, the primary issue is it's easy to ask somebody in a simple question like that um the question of the the, the, the problem with abortion is that the question itself people know they have been used to lying about and they have been used to lying to other people and to their own conscience about. Um, and the great benefit of the Alito decision, if it becomes a decision, um, and I guess we won't know for a couple of weeks, uh, is that it forces us to clarify what we really mean. That we really don't mean pro-choice. Because if we really meant pro-choice, we're not saying you're we're in favor of abortion rights from conception to i don't know 20 minutes after delivery 10 mm-hmm. minutes before delivery we're not saying that 20 minutes we're after not saying and we're saying you're pro-life well you know the the dobbs in mississippi's not pro-life it's just 50 the first trimester mm-hmm. um so all of these gray complicated areas are <laughs> where you sort of examine your own conscience or where if you are uh, arguing in good faith, you try to persuade your friends and neighbors and loved ones and maybe even fellow citizens of your of why you believe what you believe. Zero of those things can be adequately discussed with a Washington Post reporter if you're an executive or designer at a game company. It just seems so stupid to me. And the, the fact that the entire... And I, I say the, pro, the pro-life co- movement is probably this way too, but I don't really, I'm not quite 100% sure about this, but I'm 100% sure that the traditional pro-choice community is so unused to having to talk to people about the complexities of it and the Mm -hmm. complexities of their conscience and the complexities of what human life is, that they are absolutely, they they see no reason why you shouldn't have a snap answer to this very complicated question that has been bedeviling people for 50 years and has caused a lot of people to change their mind based on things like an ultrasound, things like mm-hmm. having a baby, things like seeing a baby in an ultrasound. And well, you can't do that. I mean, you, yeah. you're not going to be able to do that under the law, the law that they just attempted to pass, right? Yeah, there's a lot of that. So I mean, that's one one of the reasons why that that law, instead of being a normal law appealing to normal people, and codifying Roe v. Wade, which is a 50 year old uh, decision, went way, way, way farther than it needed to. Which is another reason why what is what is equally surprising to me that Joe Biden is a terrible president, an incompetent administrator as president, and his team is incompetent. Is that Chuck Schumer, who's been sitting in the wings in the Senate for so long, watching good and bad Senate majority leaders is so terrible Mm -hmm. at a job which has essentially given him so many gifts, which is his hands are halfway tied around his back and he could get so much done if uh, if he could convince Joe Manchin and one one lady from Maine, pick any lady from Maine, uh, and he simply can't do it. He could have been the hero here, but mm-hmm. instead he's so in the thrall of the crackpot left wing um, that he got nothing done. And to, to me, it's just baffling. It's baffling. And and the Washington Post reporter asking game companies 
to to you know, snap their fingers and render a judgment on this, and the, their their inability to understand that this is actually a complicated issue. That good people, really decent people, some of them are even liberals. Some of them may even be climate change activists, are on yeah. the fence or in a gray zone about this. Um, doesn't speak doesn't doesn't make me optimistic for the chances of the big umbrella pro-choice movement to convince American voters uh, to agree with them, which is what the Alito decision asks right. them to do. And if, no. if you're refusing to do that, if your argument is we hate we hate Justice Alito because he's going to make us have to persuade people. Um, I don't know. That's not that's not moving me. Well, persuading people leads to compromise, and you can't have that. You talk about how it's complicated. If you pass or attempt to pass a bill which does away with all state restrictions, which does away with the ultrasound requirements, which even chips away at RIFRA when it comes to forcing rel- religious institutions against their beliefs to commit to uh, to perform abortions, right, right. then you are not interested in persuasion. You are you don't think that it's complicated at all, at all. It is simply any. Thing that gets between right. this and that is wrong and is oppressive and patriarchal and handmaiden's tale and the rest of it. And we have to put on our red costumes. Anything short of what they wanted to pass it tells you that there's really not much room or desire for complicated thinking or persuasion otherwise. Because if you if you need to be persuaded, then you are wrong thinking and you are wrong thinking probably for reasons that have to do with Christianity or patriarchy. Full stop on that, because we want to talk about something else. As I mentioned before, I am in New York and I am in a hotel room. And I got to tell I like this place. It's a great place. But I am just not crazy about the sheets. and just not. Uh, I mean, they'll do. It's a bed. I'll sleep. It's New York. I'm exhausted by the end of the day. But it's one of those places that advertises, I think, that they've got 9,000 thread count or something like that. Did you know the thread count is now? It's, it's a myth. It doesn't matter how many threads your sheets have if they're not the best threads possible. Bowl and Branch uses the best 100% organic cotton threads on earth for a superior softness and a better night's sleep. Their sheets aren't just buttery, breathable, and impossibly soft to start with. They get softer with every wash, and that's what happens with me. I can't, you know, I sleep on them, Bowl and Branch, so it's when you go elsewhere and you're not sleeping on Bowl and Branch that you realize the difference. I mean, these sheets might be new. I don't know how many times they've been used and bleached and washed and the rest of it, but I guarantee that they are the worst for wear for having been used and washed and bleached, unlike mine at home, which are as soft today as they were, well, softer than the day I got them. Signature hemmed sheets, they're called, from Bowl and Branch. They're bestseller for a reason. Bowl and Branch uses the highest quality threads on the planet for a superior softness and a better night's sleep. The sheets are made with threads so luxurious, they're beloved by three, count them three, U.S. presidents. And they feel buttery to the touch, and they're super breathable. So they're perfect for absolutely every season. Bowl and Branch did not acquire over 10,000 stellar reviews for no reason. No. When you get the best sheets in the market, people notice. They're so confident that you are going to love them. Bowl and Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free trial with free shipping and free returns on all your orders. So head over to Bowl and Branch to get total sleep satisfaction. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code RICOCHET at bowlandbranch.com. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com. Bowl and Branch, promo code RICOCHET. And we thank Bowl and Branch for sponsoring this, the Ricochet Podcast. And now we welcome back to the podcast Byron York, chief political correspondent for the Washington Examiner and a Fox News contributor. His work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Monthly, Foreign Affairs, and the New Republic. He's also the host of the very essential Byron York Show podcast available at, uh, well, this little thing we got going here called Ricochet, ricochet.com, the Byron York Show. Byron, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, hey, love to. Uh, Rob, go right ahead. Oh, I was just say, hey, Byron. So, so up until um, the the Alito opinion leak, um, I you know we'd all be on this podcast saying, look, I don't know, I don't know whether it's going to be the full red wedding for the Democrats in November, <laughs> a modified red wedding. Um, I don't know whether they're all going to go down or or most of them are going to go down. It was just a degrees of disaster. And then this weird thing happens because weird things always do happen that kind of puts it all a little bit just off kilter. And everyone's got a different spinning, a different scenario here. Um, uh, if you're the Democrats, you've got to be clinging to this like a life raft, right? We're going to make a big deal about this. And if you're Republicans, you've got to be looking at polls thinking, well, wait a minute, we're actually we're actually not out of step here. Maybe this is a winner for us, even though we've been kind of running away from it for a long time. Um, in the general, I mean. 
What do you think is going to happen if you drop a, put, put a a big? I'm assuming the Alito decision is the decision that's handed down, or basically the decision. You put a drop of that in the political, a big drop of that in the political brew for November. What's going to happen? Well, I think Republicans still win. I mean, I think that's the the, the big picture here. Uh, obviously, the leak itself, which got a lot of people, including me pretty agitated is not going to matter uh if the supreme court overturns roe versus wade that's going to matter <clears throat> now i've uh, i think there's no indication at all that whatever the court does including overthrowing roe v wade will outweigh the uh, the uh, effect of inflation uh on this these coming midterms in some cases will not out, outweigh the effect of crime in some cases will not outweigh the effect of uh of the border. But for everybody, um, inflation is still the huge thing. Now, I'm not one of these people who says the Roe decision would not have any effect, because I think it will. And I think it will certainly fire up some parts of the Democratic base, because Mm -hmm. a lot of the research showed that uh, Democrats were just not very interested in voting uh, this November. And this will get some of them interested in it. So uh, I, I think it will have an effect. It could have an effect in some House districts, but um, I don't think it is going to change the bottom line uh, that Republicans appear to be headed for a, a big victory. So is this where the Democrats uh, regret um, their relative weakness in the state houses across the country? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting is uh, I took a look at, you know, the Women's Health Protection Act is the um, the bill that Schumer forced the Senate to vote on, which he lost forty nine fifty one. Right. And, you know, it was the 2022 version of a 2021 bill, which had a lot more um, um, inflammatory rhetoric. And it talked about white supremacy and oppression and reproductive justice and all this stuff was in the 2021 version of the bill. They took it out uh, to try to make it more palatable. Um, but he, here's here's the thing here. Uh, the, the bill, which 49 out of 50 Democrats voted for, and which, by the way, uh, 218 out of 219 Democrats in the House voted for, literally one member of the Senate who's a Democrat voted against it, and one member of the House who's a Democrat voted against it. The the bill, when they talk about it codifying Roe versus Wade, one of the big things that it did, uh, would have done, was it would uh, forbid the states from passing their own restrictions on abortion. Right. So all of these restrictions that you've heard of over the years, parental uh, consent, uh, counseling, all of this stuff, a lot of it which has heavy majority support. This bill would have swept away all of that. And 49 out of 50 Democrats and all but one out of, uh, in the Senate, all but one in the House, are committed to it. And I think what we're seeing with this uproar over the leak is that, we, which we could have known anyway, which is that there's kind of a broad middle uh, yeah. in the electorate about abortion. The majority does not want to see Roe overturned. But at the same time, an even bigger majority supports limits, restrictions on abortion. So the, it, this just tells you that they reject the people who want to make abortion legal for all nine months of pregnancy with no restrictions imposed by the states. Right. They reject that as much as they would reject people who would actually make abortion illegal um, in the states. So there's this broad middle. And I think Republicans are closer to the broad middle than Democrats are right and, now. And who would have ever expected that? I mean, you know, was the, within my recent lifetime, adult lifetime, the goal for the Democrats, and they did this pretty successfully, was to uh, point to uh, certain weird Republican candidates you know, running for Missouri, Senate in Missouri or various other places, saying certain weirdo things about um, uh, abortion um, for rape or incest or I don't know, 
guy in Missouri saying, um, you know, if it's legitimate rape or even when when Trump ran in in uh, in 2016, there was a minor little dust up when he said there's got to be some punishment for these women. Right. There's got to be some punishment. Um, the idea was to always cast the Republican candidate, the pro-choice candidate, as kind of weird on this. Yeah. And it seems like really within 24 hours, 48 hours from the release of that leak of that uh, uh, opinion, the whole political calculus switched. Yeah, I think what we've, we're seeing now is the result. And I've been discussing a lot of this, like comparing the two bills uh, uh, on my podcast. I think we're seeing the result of the fight over abortion for the last uh, 50 years in that. Um, in the beginning, there were some Republicans who wanted to overturn Roe, and they just beat their head against the wall trying to right. do it. And finally, in Casey, which I think was 92, um, the court says, no, no, we're not going to overturn Roe versus Wade. And Republicans uh, around the country t basically turned to another strategy, which was to work on uh, imposing limits on abortion, um, like parental consent, uh, like uh, confining it to actual med medical facilities, that kind of stuff. They worked on imposing these limits, and a lot of them struck people as common sense. Parental notification for minors uh, who uh, right. get an abortion. These things had 60, 70, 80 plus percent support in opinion polls, and Republicans uh, were pushing to, to pass these. Now, Democrats, this put them in a position, they knew that Republicans really, their, their long-term goal was to overthrow, overturn Roe v. Wade. They knew that. They put themselves in the position of believing that anything that Republicans were uh, proposing was a nose under the tent, and that they, Democrats, must oppose it. So they ended up opposing a lot of measures that the public thinks are common sense limits on abortion, which made them appear more and more radical. And it made the Republicans appear more and more common sense. Or normal, right. Um, so mm -hmm. we have the situation. Uh, if Roe is overturned and it goes to the states, it seems like there is an opportunity for um, a lot of Republicans to gauge the feeling of the voters in each state, and it will be different in different states, uh, but to really uh, put in place a lot of these common sense limits on abortion while not outlawing it altogether. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dobbs, Mississippi seems like, you know, it's, it's fair bet to say Mississippi's going to have one of the most stringent anti abortion um, laws on the books. And Dobbs is, was it week 15? So it's first trimester plus. Yeah. Um, you know, which is essentially the, the the conception of Roe v. Wade when it was handed down in 73. Well, you see, I, I here again, I'm just not an expert in the history of abortion politics. But another thing that... Well, why not, Byron? I mean, everything... <laughs> we had you on here for a reason. Come on. <laughs> the other thing that happened while Republicans were working on these, um, these common sense restrictions is that there was the, the rise, uh, the growth of sonograms. Right, and right. that really changed a lot of people's uh, yeah. image of the fetus. Right. Uh, it and, and improved medicine uh, brought the, the time of viability earlier and earlier. Um, and also the, the Republicans um, or the use of what was called partial birth abortion, their actual coining of the phrase partial birth abortion. These are all extremely effective. And they led to more and more support for these common sense measures. Um, now, you could say that, you know, if the court were a political institution, which clearly it's not, um, <laughs> that they would just uphold the, the Mississippi law. You know, 15, right. then you'd have a political debate over 15 weeks. There would right. be a lot of people who thought six weeks in Texas was way too early because... Right. A number of uh, women, and I will say it, 
women are, are the ones who, who get pregnant. How dare you? Um, an, an right. oh, women. Okay. But, I mean, but people now. are having, I mean, the thing about it, which is so, so surprising to me, is that people in America, I, I think these are silly, but they're doing it. They're having gender reveal parties. Yeah. At what, 18 weeks, 18, 21 weeks? That's when that's, that, that occurs. Like, right. So they're having scheduling parties. They're celebrating the baby. If you, don't want, if you don't want the baby, it's not a baby. It is right, but I'm, what I'm saying is that this is a cultural thing that's happening. If you happening. do want it, it's, it's a right. right, but mm -hmm. it's a cultural thing that's happening. So it, it seems to me that I, I'm, I'm just, how do they miss, how, how does a, a big political machine that presumably is trying to keep track of this. How does a how does a big political machine miss this? Yeah. Well, I will say that going to uh, Democratic political events, and I don't go to as many as I do Republican events, but going to them like Democratic conventions, for example, when people talk about uh, abortion as being kind of a sacrament uh, in some Democratic political circles, that's really not much of an exaggeration. Um, they, the, the party views it as so foundational, so foundational that it Man. simply uh, cannot be challenged. And everybody who disagrees with it, with them on it has been run out of the party. Right. Right. And, uh, all challenges must be turned back. So this, this has become, and it would be a, I'm sure there's some good book on it that I haven't read. This would become uh, a, an incredibly important foundational tenet of the Democratic Party, which is support for abortion. All right. So I, I, I know James wants to get in here. I just got one sort of larger question about politics that, I mean, an old political friend of mine who was, you know, trying to sum up his big political philosophy of winning campaigns. He said, J -j 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 just make the other guy look weird. The other guy's going to look weird. <laughs> if you look normal, he looks weird, then you're fine. And you're looking at a, a, a president now. We were just talking before we got on. Um, his response to, uh, you know, $5 a gallon gas is to cancel drilling leases and, um, and, and uh, decertify pipeline, pipelines. His response to baby formula shortage is to send free baby formula to the border. His response to um, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, a leaked memo, a leaked opinion is to encourage people to uh, picket in front of the houses of the judges. Um, how did they get so out of time? I mean, how, how did they get so bad at this? I mean, at, at some point, aren't they looking to try to mitigate the damage? I mean, if you were a Republican strategist, this would be you couldn't write a better script for the other side. How did they get on the leak part? I, I look. I don't know who leaked it, and I don't know what their agenda was. But I do think there's a good chance that it was leaked to get it out, uh, so that there could be the kind of uproar, firestorm, and protest right. that we have seen while there was still time to change the vote, the decision. So okay. Democrats are not going to condemn these protests because the protests are the only thing they see. Is having That's the turnout. possibility of changing the decision. Now it may just cause okay. the five votes to dig in. Now on the broader picture, you know, Joe Biden was always thought to be a man who wouldn't be a good president. Uh, he ran, <laughs> he ran twice, and there was no, never anybody outside of the Biden house. Well, now that you put it that way, <laughs> he thought he would be a great president. So now he's older. He's he, he'll be yeah. eighty in November. And he has slowed down. He has lost a step, but he's still not a good president. And he wouldn't have been a good president if he'd been uh, elected at 55 years old or 60 years old. He wouldn't have been a good president. So but I guess what I mean is like, it's all but, 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 but I, I didn't expect it to be so different. I mean, um, a president, any president, President X, President Trump, President Clinton, President Bush, whatever, facing a free fall in popularity the way he has widespread disdain from the voters a drubbing in november polls i mean why why are there not heads rolling why are well, there not heads there on are, sticks? there are these foundational beliefs that are causing uh problems for example i don't know if you saw this i was very impressed by this but the the online journal vox which is not a journal of the right 
a um, bunch of leftists in the box. They do a, a story. Have Democratic or Biden administration policies contribute to inflation? The question is how much? They do a story and show you quite convincingly that it's contributed quite a bit to inflation, to this, you know, the idea that when uh, the American Relief Act was plan- was was passed, the $1.9 trillion act was passed in the first few months of Biden's uh, administration, there were there was a good idea that the economy needed some sort of stimulus, maybe in the four or five, six hundred billion dollar range. But Democrats, with all of this pent up demand, passed a one point nine trillion dollar um, bill and it and it and it overheated the economy and it contributed significantly to the inflation that we're seeing now, which Box points out is worse than other Western countries. Uh, in part because Democrats so overshot the mark in in spending. So what you have now is you have this this problem, inflation, which has been caused by another democratic sacrament, which is just spending vast vast amounts of money. And the Democrats choose their sacrament, and uh, they're going to defend this. And they're they're never going to admit that this exacerbated the problem of inflation. Right. Never, ever, ever. Uh, because it's something they just believe in. Spend as much as you can. Well, Biden said the other day in a speech that he can taste our frustration. I'm not sure <laughs> exactly kind of yeah. what that tastes like exactly. <laughs> but I know, I, mean, I know. I don't think he has any idea what to do about this. And the rest of the party seems to be it, it's see it well, because as you're right, the sacrament of spending money, you can't stop doing that. You have AOC who believes in that curious little monetary theory that says, oh, it doesn't matter. We owe it to ourselves. We can print as much as we like. Everybody go out and get a wheelbarrow. I'm sorry, we can't get a wheelbarrow to carry the cash because of supply chain issues. But Elizabeth Warren the other day came out and suggested that we ban price increases as a way to stop inflation. Yeah. Which sounds to me a little bit like wage and price controls, which sounds a little bit like history repeating itself Right in front of us once more, when previous examples of wage and price controls and all of this stuff is is, is right there to look at. I mean, it's just a yep. couple of clicks away. Do they have anything in their ideological toolbox on their side at this point as the Democratic Party is now constituted that enables them to say, yeah, we know how to do this and here's what we're going to do? They don't. Well, do they? Biden. Well, no, I don't think so. Biden made his case. He gave it his best shot on Wednesday with his um, um speech on inflation. He knew the numbers were coming out on Thursday, so he tried to get ahead of things. But he really didn't have a lot to offer. He blamed the pandemic. Uh, He blamed Vladimir Putin. Um, He blamed Rick Scott, the the senator from Florida. He blamed the oil companies. He blamed all sorts of people. Uh, But he never, ever looked at his own uh, contribution to this and the Democratic Party's contribution to this. Now, this is not to say that the after effects of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine have not had an effect on our inflation. They have. But Biden and his policies have had a significant worsening effect as well. So when he comes out, he can't say that. He talks about cracking down on the on the oil companies. He talks about achieving let's say, energy independence, except they call it real energy independence, which is somehow we're going to all become, uh, we'll be driving electric cars by 2030. And that will somehow uh, reduce inflation. They're out of ideas because the things that they have put off the table, like not spending, not passing more $1.9 trillion bills, they, they won't put off the table. No. Well, we indulged a lot of this stuff because we were fat and has- happy and everything was going well. Okay, they can talk about electric cars. Okay, they can talk about solar and windmills and the rest of it. Oh, we're making lots of gas. We're an energy exporter right now. Go ahead, have your little fantasies. But now the crunch. Now we're out of gas. The price is expensive. We've got no baby milk on the sh- shelves and inflation is rampant. And like I was saying before, you know, I'm waiting for the Skylab moment, if you remember that, Byron, when in the 70s, it seemed as if the American trajectory was that of Skylab. But we know that's not the case with a dynamic, vital, and uh, pro- 
country like ours that can change course fairly quickly, I hope. I hope. Anyway, whatever course we take, the Byron York Show will be there to describe it for you. Byron, thanks for joining us in the podcast today. Been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Always enjoy it. Thanks. Mm, great fun. You know, I am right now myself uh, close to Wall Street. I could probably go over there right now and, uh, and, and watch my investments uh, vanish. I was wondering, probably, you know, you have a stock market crash and nowadays. You aren't going to see brokers throwing themselves out of windows because uh, no. they work at home. You know, they work at home, right? <laughs> right? So it's, you know, so at the worst, it's out the second floor and they land in the bushes and they twist an ankle. Or they have a basement uh, thing. It's like, I got to walk up right. the thing. Yeah. You got to walk up the stairs to throw yourself out the window. Right. Now, the idea of the brokers right. throwing themselves out the window after the 29 crash was something of a myth. But nevertheless, uh, brokers, at least the ones that I know, feel responsible for their clients. And maybe you feel like somebody's re- you're responsible for somebody else in that sense as well. If somebody relies on you financially, let's say a child, a parent, or even a business partner, life insurance gives you peace of mind that they have a financial cushion if something happens to you. And having life insurance through your job might not be enough. Most people need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families. Now, whether you're graduating from school, you're planning a wedding, or you're welcoming a baby, you're switching jobs, now is the time to protect your family's finances. Our sponsor, Policy Genius, is here to make sure that you're not paying a cent more than you have to for the coverage you need. Well, well, they make it easy to compare your options from the top companies. They're your one stop shop to find the insurance that you need at the right price. Just head over to policygenius.com. That's policygenius.com, and you'll get started in minutes. You can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. 50% or more. The licensed agents at Policy Genius are on on hand throughout the whole process to help you understand your options and make decisions with confidence. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. Since 2014, Policy Genius has helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed over $150 billion in coverage. So head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. And we thank Policy Genius for sponsoring this, the Ricochet Podcast. And now speaking of money or its incorporeal alternative, it's time to talk to Rich Goldberg. Rich is a senior advisor at the Foundation of the Defense of Democracies, and he's the host of Ricochet Podcast, Kryptonite, with Rich Goldberg. And there he guides listeners through the intimidating, strange, and sometimes confusing, oh, what am I talking about? Always confusing for most of us, world of cryptocurrency. Uh, thanks for joining us. My Dogecoin is is in the... <laughs> in the basement. I mean, I actually have a position. You got to have that looked at. Your Dogecoin should not be sagging. Uh, that do you way. invest based on whatever Ice T tells you? Is that is that how? Yeah, that's how, it how it or? works. Yeah, I actually have a position yeah, in Ethereum, yeah. which is very small and has gotten vanishingly smaller over the last couple of months. But you know, Bitcoin is down big, and that's supposed. Bitcoin is the one in, in the offshoots. Bitcoin Cash, etc., are the ones that people say. That's the real one. The rest of this stuff is just play money for people who are trying to jump in and make something and get out. But Bitcoin is down, and a lot of people are looking at what they used to have and saying, hey, wait a minute, what happened? So there have been crashes before, right? Four or five crashes at Bitcoin price. It comes, I mean, stock markets crash too. But what is happening right now, do you think, that's making the crypto environment what it is? Well, I heard you talking about people jumping out of windows. So I, I don't think there's any jumping out of windows at the moment. But if, if they're operating in Second Life with their digital avatar and their Bitcoin going down, uh, they might have digital you know, avatar windows that they're, they're jumping out of. Listen, I, I think we talk about on the podcast all the time, what is this? Where is it going? And we've had a range of guests so far, uh, major cynics, you know, moderate cynics, major proponents, people who are in the DeFi industry already, people are pushing different products. We're going to have an episode coming out next week with Alice Leishman, uh, who's the CEO of River Financial, who's starting up a whole financial services mecca, uh, different Bitcoin type products, including how you can get your own mining. But I go back, I, I'd say listeners, if you, if you pull up Kryptonite, go back to episode two with Michael Green. Now, here's a former portfolio manager for Peter Thiel. He's now on his own. And he said, listen, this is a completely speculative asset. That's what it is. It's not a currency. It's not a money. It's not going to challenge right. government. This is a completely speculative asset. He compared it uh, to uh, all kinds of Ponzi schemes, especially the stable coins. He said the stable coins are very dangerous. You can't get an and audit just, on them. Go ahead. Yeah. Just to, just to interrupt, stable coins are 
cryptocurrencies that are pegged to or tried to peg to the U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. and they have now busted down below that to nine cents on the dollar. It, the one that we saw really go bust was Terra. Yeah. That that was the big mm -hmm. one, UST. And you know, folks like Neil Ferguson will say, "Listen, let's not compare all of them together. They're they're modeled in right. different way. Uh, okay. Terra itself was a quote unquote coupon coin where it was trying to incentivize you if the value went down below the peg, and ultimately it just wasn't backed by enough money, and so people." one of their money out and it collapsed. It was also collateralized against a whole bunch of Bitcoin and Bitcoin went down and they lost all their money. And suddenly there's a run on the coin and, and, it, and it's done. Um, but, you know, we had the secretary of treasury say, listen, this is a traditional sort of run on the bank. And in a Ponzi scheme, when you have a run and it's all built on the idea that it can only go up if people keep their money in and there's something backed by something, then yeah, it's going to keep going down. Now, what Alex will say in next week's podcast is, all these other coins are distractions. These are the speculative assets. These are where you're going to like make some money in the short term, then lose a bunch of money and forget that stuff. Bitcoin right. is the one that's here to stay. We'll see, right? There are a lot of statements that were made by the industry over the last several months in its marketing that this was a hedge against inflation. This is a hedge against energy prices. You know, this is going to be the new reserve currency. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to get paid in Bitcoin. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to go home with my paycheck right. and, you know, which is what El Salvador has tried to do and what others have proposed doing. Now, if you're in a country where you have hyperinflation and your currency is completely worthless, maybe it's still worth it to go, you know, convert into Bitcoin. But this is just simply one more very highly speculative asset and needs to be treated as such. Uh, and I think if you go back to that episode with Michael Green, he has some very good suggestions of how you prevent systemic risk here. One is, Make sure people know what they're investing in, right? Have it regulated just like any other speculative asset. Make sure that they have to do certain bare minimum audit requirements. PayPal, as he talks about, has to tell us where the money is, where they're invested in. So that right. if there's ever a fiscal crisis, we know exactly what, what's happening. The stable right. coins don't produce audits, right? They all, have, they all need to be required to do that. Uh, and then at that point, you have your eyes wide open. And if you want to go and, you know, bet the farm on something and you know but no, no no one is suggesting that bitcoin or ethereum or solana that they, these are uh, uh have been manipulated right it's just that that people feel like hey money's tight i gotta buy my groceries <clears throat> and things with actual money i gotta get out of this is that kind of what i mean when when, when people feel the pinch they get out of speculative frill investments of all kinds correct that are they are they they are not um 100 uh, percent they take their profits right i mean i'm just looking at my coinbase and not you know i should i should get out of bitcoin now because I, I made money on it over the past 10 years what am i doing like just get the money now i can use it to spend things i can, I can fill up my car with that money um and i can't do nothing with it now is bitcoin isn't that a wise strategy it could be. It could be a wise strategy. If if you are looking for a hedge against economic uncertainty and Bitcoin is not that anymore, then you just treat it as any other speculative asset that you own. But when when, but when it, could it, you and, argue that yeah, Bitcoin was a hedge against uncertainty? It seems like it's the one of the most volatile assets there is. Well, this is, I mean, I'm, it's not my words. This is the crypto industries. I mean, you should look at some of our right. guests, listen to our guests that we've had on there. Uh, we had one person on who was going down to crypto Bitcoin conference in Miami a few weeks ago, and yeah, he's selling this whole that. product of how to go on payroll and have your gig economy workers paid in crypto and be able to invest with it. And I was like, why would you want to do this? He said, well, this is the future. This is the hedge. And this is what you know, people say, like, you need to have this because it's the hedge. And it's not a hedge. It's not. A hedge. It's completely tied to the overall economic downturn. When people are avoiding risk, they're getting out of Bitcoin, clearly. You listen to like Anthony Scaramucci and others on television saying, mm -hmm. well, that's today, but that's not in five years. That's not in 10 years, right? I guess we'll see, right? You know, you, it, you never want to sell the down, right? You don't want to sell on the way down in any sort of asset. If Bitcoin has enough backing, which it clearly does for now to withstand based on all the institutional investors that are still in and getting in, you know, and we think the overall market is bottoming may not be a bad time to buy in if for a short-term play, right? If, if, uh -huh. if that's what you're looking at. But to think that this is where I want to keep my money long-term doesn't make a lot of sense until there is far more regulation, far more transparency in there. Otherwise, 
um, you know, you're really just sort of like in the middle of institutional investors making big, big bets, losing money, gaining money, and you, the investor at home, are probably going to get totally hooked. Well, they'll say that you don't need those audits because the nature of the of the blockchain itself and all the mechanisms by which these things are verified, proof of work, et cetera, means that you don't need auditors. It's it's inherently fraud proof. That may be true for Bitcoin, but for the rest of these, I have to ask, what is the difference between then, between Bitcoin and all the rest of these other coins? Or is Bitcoin plagued by the same thing that eventually will drag down these insubstantial, meaningless little items in the, you know, in, in, in the cloud, the blockchain, down to zero? What makes it? If you had money today, why would you say to somebody, well, if you're going to go for crypto, go for the Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is still sort of your standard base, right? So it's operating under its own formula and it's still being mined. And while it absolutely still will fluctuate up and down based on how many people are participating. So that Ponzi scheme feel, I think, is still there overall, right? There's still going to be some sort of value so long as people still hold it. It's still being mined. There's additional people out there. There's demand. The other, you know, financial uh, sort of ideas that have been cooked up, some of these coins, the tokens, the stable coins, the alternative coins, they're now based on different metrics, different calculations, and they're leveraging this to pay for that, Peter to pay for Paul. And so when the music stops and, and there's no chair for somebody, Terra collapses, right? So, you know, nobody's saying that Bitcoin's going to collapse down to zero overnight. I don't think anybody's predicted that. Um, these smaller coins, you know, it's possible people looking at Tether was tested, I guess, over the last 48 hours. They went down below their peg, their backup, because they had enough institutional backing to, to stay afloat. But, you know, all of these things are very, very interesting. We still have so many institutional investors getting in. We're seeing this marketed now in sports, celebrities, right? It's not going away. It's part of our reality. But it's like this like sort of weird thing where I've now been at the show now for several months. Now we've had all kinds of guests on. We're going to continue to look at this, you know, every which way. And it's like, I, I personally just don't want it. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 that, that's like my conclusion. Like, I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't think it's my future. I'm good. You're missing you know? out. And, and, you're missing out, man. You're missing out on community. <laughs> you're missing out on all the new ways we're going to transform. Everything's going to be on the blockchain. Listen, there's something, I mean, the, the other side of this, the other part connected to it, it's not a, it's not a cryptocurrency, but in that digital realm, conceptually are NFTs, right? And NFTs strike me today, like the penny stocks. They are a way for people who are mystified by the whole thing out there, don't have enough money to get into it big, but want to participate. And so they feel like this is their way of getting. So you have people who have not a lot of money, but enough that they can throw 250 bucks, 0.0027 ETH or whatever, and get a little thing. And I've been studying the way that these things are marketing and it marketed, and it's it's fascinating. Every one of them has this language about community and about what we're doing together, almost to the point where I think that it's coming from somebody who's not necessarily a native speaker of English, that they're that the, the daily run of mints of the pointless, ridiculous NFTs. If, if, if it all came out of China at some point, I wouldn't be particularly surprised. But anyway, so you get this NFT, you get into this. This strange, bizarre world where you're you're mining honey and your honey coins are used to slurp the monkey, and the monkey token gets you access to the metaverse space where they're in a fight against the boy board yacht board ape yacht club. So you can't go if the system checks to see if you've got a token from the yacht. I mean, it's just to me, it's an alternative. You're way it's, deep on this. You are way. We need to have you. We need to. Have you <laughs> yeah, what you got to have on at night. You can. Oh you can gosh. use two wow. slurps. You can two, use two slurps on a monks. Is what I'm telling you. But it, well, it, we, it, it's a. It's a. It's like a religion. It takes the place of actual social interactivity, and and people feel like they're doing something new and modern, and it's going to make them money, and it isn't. We interviewed an expert named Michael Greenwald. Uh, at the time, he was still at a family office uh, doing financial advising. He's now moved on uh, right after our episode aired to run Amazon's global strategy for digital assets going forward. He's thinking a lot about the cloud and its applications, cryptocurrency, and what's going to happen if there are central bank digital currencies and the Fed has a digital dollar and all these kind of things. So I asked him, you know, explain to us NFT, go through it, understand. He said, well, actually, I just went through the process so I would see it with my own eyes and understand it and be able to explain it. He said, listen, th there is a niche world for everything, right? The art world itself is a niche world. And if you put a value 
on NFT art and, and other you know forms of it, and you say this is how much I think it's worth, and this is unique, it's the only one in the world, uh, then there's going to be people who want it and people who want to put it on their digital you know walls or whatever. It's going to be on their phone. It's going to be on their frame TV in their living room, whatever. And say I I have this NFT of Michael Jordan, you know, of whatever. Now, me personally, I want the actual rookie card. I don't want the NFT. I don't I don't really get it. But there are people out there who do. They're willing to pay big bucks for it. And his point is like, listen, you're not you're not an art collector. You know that world is not massive, right? But but there's going to be a world of NFT, and there's a value for it, and it's going to move. And we should have concerns about money laundering, just as we do in the art world itself and in other uh, situations. And we need to be very cognizant of it and put controls in place. But he's very convinced that, you know, he's in love with the NFT he bought and he, you know, thinks other people are going to stay in that space and it will continue to have value. Yeah. And it, it, one interesting thing I thought was, he said, because of the blockchain attached to it, every time it moves ownership, the original artist could still get a royalty. Right, right. That's, Which, a, that's what's interesting to, for people in the larger art market. The idea of a blockchain ledger for you know, physical three-dimensional art sales. Right. Which, which makes sense to me, which makes sense to me. The NFT, you know, uh, you know, a lot of these things are just, it, it's so an acquired to a JPEG. <laughs> well, it is, but I mean, if it's a JPEG by Beeple or by David Lynch, or if it's Madonna scanning her private parts and putting them up, that, that is a unique item. The culture that I'm talking about are the, the places, that, I don't know. Everybody's seen that. The places that mint 999 <laughs> little, you know, algorithmically generated pictures of a mouse head. Um, that's, that's the stuff that is, but each one is unique. Yes. That's what you need to really appreciate. One has They're a unique. unicorn. One has a unicorn. You can't have, the, you can't have another one. No, it just doesn't exist. I don't know why you'd want one in the first place. Kryptonite is the podcast. Rich Goldberg and Kryptonite, of course, the podcast is available here on Ricochet. Uh, it's fascinating. Podcast and Ricochet that we've mentioned it. Coincidence. Yeah. And it's fascinating. It's a great podcast. And it, um, if you're, if you're, you know, we read about all this stuff all the time. And like you're like me, sometimes you bleep over it because it's just too complicated. This is the podcast for you. This stuff isn't going away. And also, it's kind of fun now. It's more fun to read about people who are losing money on something you don't really understand. Now is a good time to learn about it because you can feel good about yourself because you're not missing out. Right. You're just watching people lose some money. I mean, uh, just check Bitcoin year to date. It's down 37%, almost 40%. S&P, though, year to date, it's down 30 years, almost 18%. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, okay. now it's a good time to learn because you don't want to, you don't want to be in anyway. Anyway, so yes, get your, uh, get your, your crypto info from Rich Goldberg. And thanks for joining us on the podcast today. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Go back to the beginning, episode one forward. Now is the time to learn, get caught up, uh, listen to these pressing episodes because it's going to make a difference. Agreed. Well, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in my hotel room. As I said, we're going to come to a conclusion soon, but I'm staring up at this television set, this enormous TV set right above me here. And when I first turned it on, it told me that I could watch Netflix. Well, you know what that is? That's a thing about that. Yeah, I can watch some Netflix. I just can't watch all that Netflix has. Some people say that's not fair by the fact that Netflix hides thousands of shows, movies from you based on your location. That has the knife to increase the prices on you. That's right. They just increased their prices again. Well, you could, uh, oh, I could cancel, sure, in protest, or you could be smart about it and make sure you're getting your full money's worth by using ExpressVPN. You see, you might not know what's on Netflix in your country because it's completely different from what Netflix has on the UK or Japan. If you use ExpressVPN, however, you can control which country you want Netflix to think you're in. ExpressVPN has over 90 countries to choose some, so every time you run out of stuff to watch one country, <laughs> switch to another and unlock new shows. For example, you want to check out Star Trek Discovery for various reasons, and there are lots of them. <clears throat> oh, it's not on U.S. Netflix, no, but with one tap of a button, ExpressVPN lets you change your location to Australia, and you can watch it there. I still have the same accents, though. Here's the best part. It's not just for Netflix. You can use ExpressVPN to unlock shows and other streaming services, too. I like it for the BBC, because the Beeb seems to think that if you don't pay their license fees, you haven't the right, hasn't the right to watch what they do. Well, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in the BBC. Well, it's only available free on the UK, but change your location with ExpressVPN, and there you go. It's also super fast, and it works on your phone, your laptop, and even smart TVs. So you can watch your shows on the big screen with zero buffering. 
And also, you know, if you're traveling, uh, trust me, you want to access some stuff that's a little sensitive, you want a VPN, which is something that I've been going through this last few days. Stop paying full price for streaming services and getting only access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash ricochet. Don't forget to use our link so you can get three free extra months of ExpressVPN. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash ricochet expressvpn.com slash ricochet and we thank expressvpn for sponsoring this the podcast well rob before we go um people will be listening to the show after tomorrow and so i'm sure they'll really want to hear in advance something that's already happened so they can feel bad about yeah not they're gonna miss in the first place tell them what they're gonna miss tell them what they yeah. missed they're gonna miss well they, they may not they may not maybe if you listen to it i mean if you run hurry hurry over uh to the first ricochet and not the last ricochet but the first ricochet pub crawl we are celebrating uh the beginning of our restarting of our in real life irl kind of get get togethers so but it's still not too late you can sign up for a co-branded ricochet america's future bar crawl new york city it starts at City Vineyard, City Vineyard, not City Winery. Make sure because there's a City Winery and the City Vineyard. City Vineyard is a little farther downtown, closer to um, the financial district. It's two three three West Street, so City Vineyard, uh, New York, New York one double zero one three. Saturday, this Saturday, tomorrow, three p.m. This is your chance to hang out with me, James, Andrew Gutman, friends, old and new. I know some people are coming. My, I think my old friend Nick Gillespie's coming. Uh, a bunch of other people are going to be there. It'll be lots of fun. Like, and uh, by the way, Gillespie is very eager to. He told me he's coming because he wants to talk to you. Really? Um, he is Gillespie is a big lilac. Well, it goes both ways. Um, That's great. So. So sign up now at ricochet.com slash special. Use the coupon FUTURE at checkout to get a special discount and a free pass to the event. But also, if for some reason you're kicking yourself, you're not going to be in New York City tomorrow, which is, I, I guess, uh, okay as an excuse, um, save the date for our next Ricochet event, which is in a month, almost exactly one month from now. See, this is starting to happen. We're really getting back into this. Uh, Byron York he will be recording his own Byron York Show podcast, recorded live at Hillsdale's Washington DC campus with Federalist editor in chief and Fox News contributor. But you know, we know her. Let's it's just be real. Bizarre. Ricochet's own oh, Molly Henry yeah. next month. So that'll be Wednesday, June 15 at 6 p.m. It'll be a fun evening. These guys are great. They're gonna be fun together. They're fun separately. Uh Byron is like always ter- yeah. Byron's always terrific. <laughs> He's terrific today. He's always got it together. And Molly, of course, is so much fun. So and a man more of sign of enviable hair. You know, yeah, he's got enviable hair. That's true. Yeah. Uh, more sign up details will cover very soon. But look, again, uh, you can only come to these events if you're a member. It's worth it. Join. Come to these events. Join Ricochet. Sign up today. Ricochet.com slash join. You get 14 days free. So you can't go wrong. And uh, I said this last week and the week before. and <laughs> I'm going to say it again. We have a gigantic legal bill we need to pay. It uh, it 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 hasn't gotten any larger in the past two weeks, thank God. But it has. We we now know exactly how much we owe, and it's really, it, frankly, it's more than we can afford. Um, by a by a by a not quite a zero, but way up there. And so we absolutely need your help. So if you've been thinking about joining and you've been wondering why, and you can't come to pub crawl, and you can maybe come to DC thing, and you're. Uh, we need you to join. Please do. Uh, you will be helping us continue this project into the future. Uh, and I know it's a bitter pill to swallow to say, I'm just going to give you money so you can give it to some enraged leftist who wants to put you out of business. And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, that is what I offer you. Um, but uh, we need it. And we would like you to uh, join and be a part not of the struggle. It's not up there with blood, sweat, and tears as a, as a, as a leader. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Luckily, if it makes you feel any better, I don't think the enraged leftist is going to get much either. It's really yeah. going to go to the lawyers, which has got its own set of problems. But, you know, that's not, again, that's normal. Well, walking around New York City this morning, I noticed a lot of people were downcast, wearing black, and the rest of us in very sort of in a somber mood. And when I stopped one and asked and said, why, why, why the long face? What seems to be the problem? They said, well, it's, it's Jen Psaki's last day as a White House press secretary. <laughs> and a lot of people are, yeah, taking, a lot of people are taking this hard. Uh, it's going to be replaced by Karen, Karen, there's an E on the end, Jean-Pierre, yeah. Jean-Pierre. I, I don't know how to pronounce this yet, and I'm sure I don't know. that Karine Jean-Pierre, who was uh, getting a lot of attention on the left before the historic business about being the first black openly gay female to fill the role, couldn't care less. What matters is her ability to tell the truth as in as much as they can in that job, I suppose. And I am looking some forward to somebody right. who is going to not circle back and be as, as, as condescending 
as Miss Saki was. I know that she was revered that she she handled all those rapscallions in the press corps. You know, that that ravening pack of angry people who every day took her to task with the most forceful sense. However, did she do it? But are you sad to see her go, Rob? Or are you do you actually wish sometimes that this whole institution of back and forth lying and posturing was just simply perhaps <laughs> abandoned and we do it once a week? And, you know, I'd rather have question time in the house. But, I, but. I, I think it's dumb kabuki, right? Because the yeah. people who care end up just saying what they say. And then it appears on the news channel that you've already right. selected that gave you the news the way you want to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and none of it can cover up the stuff that matters and the American people, the big people in the middle, the ones who kind of don't watch Fox news and kind of don't watch MSNBC or even CNN just kind of like live their lives. Um, they don't watch this stuff, but they, they, certain things get through to them. And those are the things that really are more about management than about, you know, Jim Sack, Sacky, Sacky. She can try all she wants. Um, I think she can do all she wants. She can try all she wants to spin but she's only spinning people who either totally agree with her or totally disagree with her. It's just really kind of a waste of time and money. What the by the time it gets to that lectern, um, they've already lost or won. It seems to me because that means the administration has kind of lost its way. It is it's neither touting its successes nor uh, uh, explaining away its failures. It's already kind of lost the thread of the conversation. You have to kind of be winning already, um, and I. I'm surprised that, um, you know, I mean, it took Clinton a while to figure it out. Uh, Obama didn't really have to figure it out because the press was so incredibly lick spittle and compliant and would just really repeat whatever he said. Um, of course, everybody hate, they all hated Trump so much that every every single one of those press briefings was just this, you know, horrible, vicious bitchy back and forth mm -hmm. no matter who was at, at the lectern um so uh, you know the, these things i think i mean if i were president i wouldn't have them no i would just i, I think there i would i turn it into like a little little coffee room and people could come and get a cup of coffee and a donut and then i would pass out little sheets it's a waste of time and like let everybody read it yeah i'd like to go back to what they have in the, you know in england question time where the where the, where the president actually goes and stands there in the well and, oh and get and gets questions put to him and there's yays and nays and, and groans and the rest of it. I would love that, except that we don't <laughs> we don't really have a uh, you know we don't have politicians who are able to spontaneously craft the amount of oratory required to make their also point like we ever. have equal these branches of uh, we have equal branches of government. So why should these these why should these these low rent congressmen get to question the president of the United States? It's like <laughs> right. they don't know, right. like nobody. Just grandstand, you know, really, Maxine Waters uh -huh. should be allowed to, like, stand up there and dem question the president. No, forget it. No way. No, I'd love like, to see uh, these, these, uh, you know, I would love to find. I would sure. absolutely love to see Rand Paul um, ask some piercing economic questions about, uh, to Joe Biden. To wrap everything up, you said at the beginning of the show that you thought the Biden administration was being reasonably competent in their Ukrainian policy, even though you didn't agree with it. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us what you didn't agree with it well i mean i, I said we, we're competent in that they they have a policy and that policy is to kind of thread the needle in a uh and to play for time and to sort of herd the europeans in a kind of a weasel wordy have half kind of way uh slowly along and try to make slow uh um progress with you with europe with the french and with the germans and and in that sense i suppose you could say that they have been um that, that they that's a that's a policy they 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 have executed that policy um it seems to me that what they've done is they've been extremely lucky they've been playing for time and time so far has been um kind of on their side but not really on their side it's been on the side of uh, the, the ukrainians the ukrainians are the ones who have uh, uh literally skin in the game blood in the game um you know mariupol is going to fall to the russians without a doubt and all the people there are going to die and the russians are going to kill them all um that's i mean i went and was briefed on this on, t on uh, tuesday night um, from very knowledgeable people, and it was, uh, you know, it's it's, it's grim. Um, there's probably uh, the Russian army is as this is. I'm just repeating what I heard, so I'm not. I'm not. These these are people who've been studying this. Russian army is, uh, you know, very very close to actually falling apart to, to pure disintegration. Um, 
they can't, because of the way they've been deploying their troops and the, because of the troops, specific troops they've been deploying, including FSB troops, meaning the internal mm-hmm. security troops that are now in the Ukraine and the uh, untrained raw recruits are now in Ukraine and the training officers, the training corps that are supposed to train the new recruits are also in Ukraine. So they no longer, they don't have new recruits and don't have anybody to train those recruits. We're talking about a six month period for the Russians in which the Russian ability to fight will be degraded uh, until maybe December, January, 2023. So the two things could happen. One, three things, right? One is the Russians could dig in, in which case they stop trying to take more territory. They just try to hold what they've got, which would be the smart thing for them to do. Two is they to keep going for broke, depending on what the Ukrainians do. Three is they try to make a mess in Moldova so that they can start bargaining away in Moldova uh, to keep uh, the whatever gains they have in the East. Um, What they don't count on, and which right now the Ukrainians probably couldn't muster, is a Ukrainian counteroffensive, which if it came in the next eight to ten weeks, could actually break the back of the Russian army. Um, Which is something that um, is either a policy or it's not a policy. It's certainly not a policy of the Europeans. I mean, Macron said this week that we should be looking for ways not to humiliate Putin. Uh, it's unclear whether it, it, it seems like it's not a policy for the United States, but I think the United States policy and the Ukrainian policy are going to start to diverge because if you're Zelensky, if you're Ukrainians, you're like, well, wait a minute, w- w- why are we putting up with all of this? Uh, and by the way, it is according to these guys that I talked to, it is a bloodbath there. It is not, this is the, the, the Russian atrocities are staggering. Everyone who is, even on the fence of saying, well, you know, the Russians, uh, my advice to you is to sort of clam up a little bit because you're going to be, it's going to be really ugly soon. And it's going to be revealed just how bad they have been. Just the, the sheer number of civilian deaths, the sheer number of mass graves, the sheer number of like what they've been doing, the filtering, they call it filtria, filtraska, Mm -hmm. where they go through systematically through a town and, and, and execute civilians, um, for having certain character traits. Um, so, so if you're Zelensky, you're like, well, what's this all been for? It, we, we want the original borders of Ukraine restored. Um, so he may, why should he make a deal? Maybe he should fight. Maybe a counteroffensive rather than a defensive action, which means they need artillery. Right, which they're getting. Um, more than they're anything. getting. They're getting very which, expensive, right. very powerful, very accurate artillery. Which, which right. the more they push north and east, allows them to hit the supply lines and the rail lines and and, and do damage right. the likes of which they've never done before. So yes, it has been bloody and it's been hard. But uh, if you want to look at if, if you had to throw your lot in with one or the other, purely on the question of morale, where would you go? Oh, the Ukrainians for sure. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, it's like they're right. They're defending, defending their country as, as opposed to the Russians. Yeah. 20,000 Russian dead is a, an, a, 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 probably an underestimate at this point. I mean, it's staggering what the, the, the disaster of the Russian army, the, the problem of course, is that there are nukes, right? So w- what happens to the nukes? The, 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 the complication is that we have no evidence that he's not going to use the nukes anyway theater, you know, tactical theater weapons anyway. So we, we don't really have that much leverage over him. It's as if the, the theory is from the West is always, okay, well, if we do X, Y, and Z, then he won't use the nukes, but he might use them anyway. It actually might be at this point in his rational best interest to use them if he wants to preserve himself and his power. Um, use them how and where, though. It is very difficult for Putin to say, I have come to liberate and denazify Eastern Ukraine. And I'm also going to completely right. irradiate it and make it uninhabitable for the people to live there. I mean, what he's done, what he, right. what he's done to de-Russify the attitudes in the eastern provinces, from what I understand, the people that I've talked to, I, people who previously were just, you know, here I am, I'm living in this, the Russians are here, whatever. Now they hate these people they, intensely, and they want them all dead yeah. because of what's happened. So right. it's unlikely that he's going to nuke that region. It seems unlikely that he's going to throw a nuke into Kiev. And I'm saying Kiev because I've been saying it all my life. I'm not going to say yeah, yeah. Gonna, Chicken I'm Kiev. Say yeah. So I'm going to say Kiev. Kiev. Dang it. Um, when I say Kiev, I mean, it's just anyway. He's not going to nuke Kiev because then no, no, no. Okay, so, so but also like so he you, may not be able to launch it, right? Well, there's that. 
So, I mean, but the Russians were great at their tactical battlefield nukes, right? The little tiny ones, which make, which have, but those were against mass amounts of NATO armor that was pouring over the border or pouring towards the border to defend against the Russians. So there's, I mean, who are you going to nuke? I hate to make a Ghostbuster song out of this, but if you've got the Ukrainian forces dispersed and doing all kinds of very clever communications, there's right. the command and control is right. so much better, obviously, than the Russians. Um, who's there to nuke? It'd be better to use chemical or biological, which and then biological, you know, again, what are you going to do? Give them smallpox while they're hiding in the forest? They run. Um, so I, I yeah, it's very close to Belarus. I'm not sure right. how that works. No, all that's all that's true. All that is true. I guess the question is that, that in, in many ways, the opportunity for Americans is. Is that we don't have to want this more than the Ukrainians. They seem to want it yeah. appropriately as much as they possibly can. And we don't have to send. American military there, and we don't have no. to provide them with almost anything. No, well, we, um, we can sell them some stuff. We can do the lend lease thing, but we don't. We, sell we, we don't have stuff. to fly over. We don't have to send troops. No, you know, we don't have to do. Are any there of that. a couple of advisors on the ground? Probably. Are there a couple of you know? Is there some back and forth coordination? We've all. I wish the administration wouldn't say. Uh, well, yeah, we've been helping them with with satellite information. Sure, absolutely. I mean, just shut up about that. Can we just keep our that mouth shut yeah. about something? But you said that the policy interests diverge because um, Zelensky wants the whole country back, and Macron doesn't think that Putin should be weakened by this. I'm not particularly you know saddened if he is, but Biden has said. He's evil. He's a monster. He has to go. I mean, but the Biden administration has said, <laughs> yeah, but well, they walked it back. The yeah. regime change is part. They, now, they can back. walk it back. But what world leader, having learned that the president of the United States wants them dead, says, boy, I hope right. they take that back tomorrow. I'm not going to sleep well tonight until they do. No, you can't take that. You can't. You can't. Right. So if if we take them at face value, then the administration and the left, which got in favor of this war for a variety of reasons, um, is now in the same page as Zelensky, and, and you're not going to see that divergence at all. The, 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 yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's. I mean, it's really a really. Int- I mean, look, uh, people. I, I, I'm I'm not trying to sound cold, but I, it is also a fascinating situation, mm-hmm. right? Because you have uh, a leader who, until a year ago, um, if you uh, were watching MSNBC or reading the newspaper, or the New York Times, he was a st- brilliant super villain who was thinking five steps ahead. Mm-hmm. Putin was so smart, he was altering the way Americans vote. He 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 personally selected a U.S. president. That's how what a genius he is. Mm-hmm. Turns out he's not that smart. If you had read certain um, very conservative American um, web publications that he was a, a proud uh, defender of traditional western values which is we know is not true either um it, it turns out he's just kind of a a thug and a paranoid and gotten gotten weirder and more paranoid as he gets older and the one thing the guy should have known one thing every leader should know especially as he goes forth and tries to invade another country is what is the precise strength of his armed forces and he didn't know that he didn't know the one thing he needed to know. Well, he couldn't. Um, Who's going to tell him? Well, he, Who's going to tell well, him? That right, the, I, I personally right. presided over. He the has Holland recreated. Place. He has recreated the old Soviet Union in one institution, the worst possible institution for it to be right. recreated. And that's the armed forces, mm-hmm. right? And that is not smart, and that is not good thinking, and that is not good leadership, and that is nothing to be admired. And he's now in his sad little country, sad country, is reaping the whirlwind, and it's too bad for them. Um, but for us, it's sort of fascinating, and it's also fascinating to discover how many complicated deals and understandings there are with this big Russian gas station, right? So now the Chinese are in trouble. I am personally thinking uh, I would, if I were the, if I were a pres- sentient president who wasn't sleeping most of the afternoon, I might call up the call up the Israeli prime minister and say, "Excuse me, what is exactly your precise position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine?" I think it's insufficiently on our side you uh, you want my support for you in this country how about you stand you 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 make an obviously very clean call and say that putin should not invade ukraine you, the israelis have been really bad on this mm-hmm. very very bad on this well they got on we bo- kind of got on board after the holocaust it. after the holocaust and the Zelensky jewish hitler questions but what would you want from israel in return would you want more gas and oil once leviathan money money you want money from money and also like but also like for the, the, the israelis could respond and say how come you're not letting us build that pipeline 
which of course the the um, mm-hmm. the stupid Bush, uh, stupid Biden administration mm-hmm. didn't let him do. Mm-hmm. Well, we could go on and on about that, but unfortunately, we <laughs> yeah. we, we tax we tax your patience as it is. And I got to save some little voice here for tomorrow because I know I'll be absolutely. I'm not yeah. going to say another word today so that I can speak <laughs> loudly. You're going to rest your instrument so I can close talk to everybody because I'm going to be in New York and I'll gesture a lot because I'll be in New York and uh, and all the rest of it. No, what am I talking about? I'll stand like a it. sore thumb like a Minnesotan doesn't know what he's doing. Forget here we go. Forget about it. Forget about it. I'm walking here. I got to oh, leave with this. You know, I, 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 New Yorkers are disappointing me like you wouldn't believe because it used to be walking down the street, right? Don't make eye contact with, contact with anybody because they'll stab you, right? Or even worse, ask for directions. You know, just just walk, right? That's the New York walking style. Now everybody is 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 hunched down, right? They're all looking at their phones. And it's just absolutely weird, right? So I'm thinking the idea that there's even a a, a, a spark of the Razzo Rizzo in these people anymore that somebody would slam on a car hood when a car encroaches on the intersection and say, "I'm walking here," you know? Is that gone? Is that? I swear to God, I wrote that, um, I wrote that in a column. And then I stepped outside after I finished the column to write a cigar. <laughs> and I'm walking out and I'm there's a, this family that's moving down the street, mom, dad, and two little kids. And the dad says to the kids, what do we say if a car starts to go through the intersection? And the kids, like 7, 10, both shout in unison, I'm walking here. He said, what do we Really? I'm walking. I'm charmed to my heart. I can't believe it. I, I said it didn't exist. Here literally is the father bird teaching his younglings how to properly respond when the car gets into the intersection. I was sad. <laughs> so to my dismay, they turned into my hotel. They walked to the elevator. I walked with them. They're not from here. They're not from here at all. So the only I can think if the New Yorker spirit like that is brought back, it's because of the immigrants is because of those who come to this great city and remind them of the character and spirit that they had, that they were indeed walking here. Without a doubt. Brought to you by Bull and Branch, Paul C. Genius, and ExpressVPN. Support them for supporting us. And join Ricochet today, won't you? Please take a minute, if you won't, please, to leave a five-star review at Apple Podcasts. Helps new listeners discover us, which helps keep the show going, etc. Hope to see you on Saturday with Rob. It'll be great. Everybody else, well, we'll see you in the comments. Oh, by the way, Peter, Peter Robinson, remember him? He'll be back. He's just away. He'll be back next week. Until then, we'll see you in the comments at Ricochet 4.0. Next week. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Ricochet. Join the conversation.